and graduate studies. Uh, before I give you some brief background information about the lecture series, I would like to acknowledge some distinguished guests uh, in the audience. I may not be able to name them all, but we have, um, we have several police chiefs, uh, Troy Hagen, Marlo Pritchard, and uh, Rick Borissa. I see them there. And we also have uh, Branda Butterworth Carr, Assistant Commissioner, F Division RCMP. I believe she's sitting right over there. And I will also uh, welcome Kevin Pernwick, Deputy Minister of Justice, and also Gordon Wichowski, after whom this lecture series was named. And I would like to thank them all for attending today's lecture. And um, I would like to acknowledge the ongoing contribution of the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan to the Gordon Wichowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Chair in Police Studies Lecture Series. And today's lecture is part of the uh, lecture series which have, has been continuing for a number of years now. And um, Obviously, we owe a great deal to the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan for their contribution. And the Law Foundation of Saskatchewan is an organization dedicated to enhancing legal education and research in order to respond to challenges facing the administration of justice. And thanks to the generous support of this organization, the Law Foundation Chair in Police Studies was established in 2005 at the University of Regina and Faculty of Arts. And the Law Foundation Chair allows the university to function as a center of excellence in police studies, enabling the chair to support issues of direct relevance to policing in Saskatchewan, to bring world-renowned experts in the field of criminal justice, to share their expertise with us, and to participate in, na in national, dis national discussions about current policing practices. In support of all these goals, each fall a speaker is invited to deliver the Gordon Wichowski Law Foundation of Saskatchewan Chair in Police Studies Lectures. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have welcomed several renowned guest lecturers to this stage in the past several years. And this year, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Scott Decker, who will be delivering uh, a lecture entitled Smart Policing and the Challenge of Translational uh, Criminology. I now invite Dr. Rick Ruddle, the Chair in Police Studies, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, we're going to spend about the next hour learning a little bit about smart policing. Uh, from Scott, Scott Decker, uh, has been instrumental in, in the field of criminal justice in research. In particular, he came up with a number of his colleagues about the very strange idea of interviewing offenders. So all throughout the 1990s, he interviewed active armed robbers, gang members, residential burglars. Uh, these weren't people who were in prison. They had to go out and find them on the street. So very hands-on approach to research. And he's uh, established himself as an expert in criminal justice policy, not only that, but in his spare time, he built two of the strongest uh, criminology and criminal justice departments in the United States, both top five programs, one in St. Louis and one in Arizona. So without any further chatting, I'd like to welcome Scott. Thank you, Ray. 
topic. Um, it's an especial pleasure for me to be here tonight because Rick was one of my students and uh, you're always proud when you see your students do well. You want to see them graduate and go on and get jobs and <laughs> good things that are associated with that. Uh, but in, in this case, Rick's really excelled in of the many students that I've had through the years, uh, there's no one I'm more proud of than what Rick Riddell has done and will continue to do in his career. Thanks as well to Milagros for organizing a disorganized college professor and getting him into town, and I'm sure out of town tomorrow. Uh, the university, uh, the RCMP, who provided uh, quite a nice uh, tour of the depot. I've learned to the correct pronunciation of the word uh, this afternoon. Uh, the Regina Police Department, whose gang squad graciously spent some time with me answering my dumb American questions, and the Law Foundation of, of Saskatchewan. And I guess the first question that arises and is, when you look at the title, um, does this imply we were doing dumb policing before, or that we weren't smart? Uh, no, I think the title implies something about the packaging and the marketing, and the need to stay focused in a way that goes uh, uh, beyond what we've done in the past, whether the iterations of innovation and change in policing have been team policing, or community policing, or problem-oriented policing. I think what smart policing causes us to do is to refocus our attention in important ways uh, that keep our eye on the ball. And uh, I, you know, I, I was invited to the Netherlands to talk about homicide. I've done a fair amount of research on homicide. And uh, when, they, when they got in touch, my response was, really? Uh, we have more homicides in the city that I live in pick to your city, Phoenix or St. Louis, uh, than they have in the entire country. Um, our rates per 100,000 are 10, 20, 30 times higher. And so my question has always been, why would you bring an American to talk about crime and criminal justice when it's clear that we haven't been very successful? And, and in fact, we failed in many important ways. We have a large number of struggles today. Uh, I used to say the two most difficult jobs in America are teaching seventh grade <laughs> and being a police chief. And now being a police chief has passed up teaching seventh grade uh, in, in my country and will, for, will continue for a while. So maybe there's something in the next 45 or 50 minutes that an American can stumble over and provide some insight on, uh, but you'll be the judge of that. So smart policing is problem focused, it's data driven, the, the nagging question that gets asked a lot in smart policing is, according to what? What do the data say? Full well understanding that the luxury of spending a day, a week, six months, gathering data, analyzing data, querying the data is not a luxury that an officer in a car who's got calls to clear on their shift or a lieutenant who's got a dead body or a police chief who's got the press at her or his door has. These are luxuries that don't exist uh, uh, for too many of us in our jobs and yet if we don't pay attention to data we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. And the right answer is no longer because we've always done it that way. I, I, I always hated the answer from my teachers or my parents that said, because I said so, or because we've always done it that way. Well, in St. Louis, where I used to live and work, which had the highest homicide rate for 14 out of the 18 years that I was working with, the mayor and the police chief to look at the problem in the country, the way we always did it was what got us to be the most dangerous city in America and kept us there. And if that isn't an impetus to change, then I don't know what is. We need to be prevented. We need to get out in front of problems rather than cleaning the mess up every time. We have to be accountable. In, in the city I used to work in, 
the police chief, the mayor, the U.S. attorney, and the prosecutor in the most violent city in America had never met on a regular basis to talk about crime. So it was easy for me, the outsider, to walk in and say, gee, these four people own a piece of the problem. Maybe they ought to sit down and talk together. Maybe they ought to sit down on a monthly basis, plan for policy, plan for responses, coordinate, and think about doing what I think is the, and we, we talked about some at lunch today, the hardest thing to do and the most important thing to do without which we won't be successful, that's changing the culture. That's changing the way and we see problems and the values and the relationships and the tools that we bring to problems. So partnerships are important. Smart policing is committed to change and it needs to be sustainable. I've worked any number of programs and we'll take a program because it might bring some money, might bring some resources, it might bring some positions. But when that program is gone, it's returned to baseline. And what we need is change that is going to last a while. What we need is change that can be sustained when the program's gone. Worked with a number of U.S. attorneys and when I would come and talk to new uh, existing assistant U.S. attorneys, federal prosecutors, I had one tell me at one point in time in response to a gun problem, this was a few years ago because he called me Sonny, and, and he said, Sonny, I lived through this program, I lived through that program, and you and this new thing are going to be gone in three or four years, and I'm still going to be here in my office. And I wanted to say, but didn't, and you're still going to have the same problem to deal with then that you do now. So, boy, this is a lot of words about smart policing, but it's analytics, it's data-driven, it's paying attention to the problem. It's focusing on outcomes. And then there's translational criminology. This is, this is a relatively new phrase in the vocabulary of criminologists. This is a word that says, okay, you people who think you're so smart who produce all this research, how do you take a set of findings and bring it to practice? How do you, the question that police chiefs and mayors and heads of probation and parole and juvenile courts have asked when they look at our journals. I can remember Bill Bratton, who, who I count as a friend, who I've worked with on multiple projects, holding up Criminology, our lead journal. If you publish in Criminology, you're, you're a big deal. Uh, every time, and it's only been four or five in my career, I published there, I, well, I was really proud. Bratton held the book the journal up at a meeting and said, what does this tell me about dealing with crime in my community? Well, the problem is that most criminologists stop short of the translation. They're good at producing the research, but how it translates to practice demands a response from the research community. I think it requires a level of accountability that research criminologists have not uh, engaged in. It mandates that they reach across the aisle, if you will. Um, when Joe Mogu was chief of police in St. Louis, he invited me to attend senior leadership meetings, and I did. And then one day he said, okay, Scott, what would you do? And I don't want to you know, do that, but it's a pretty daunting question when the police chief says, I got to deal with this every day. What does all this research tell me? What should I be doing? It's an opportunity criminologists should long for and should take advantage. Well, we get a number of things when we merge smart policing with translational criminology. There ought to be a, a level of trust. Uh, there ought to be uh, uh, some leadership on both sides. Partnerships, these slides I can gladly make available to those of you trying to, to write them down. And my email will be there at the end. I am a public servant and uh, my email is a matter of public record and I respond to email, so if you wish to email, please do. Uh, smart policing has to value community <coughs> input. The communities in America that have weathered the storm of Freddie Gray in Baltimore, of Mike Brown in Ferguson, uh, and, and the other incidents of officer-involved shootings that have taken place, the communities that have made it work are communities that had a relationship 
with police departments before those events took place, the wrong time to put the community and law enforcement together, the hardest time is after an incident, the time to do it is well in advance. The train for the future, I worked with a police chief who after 11 years was recently fired and he told me when we produced our findings, he said I just hope I make it till my I fully vest at the chief's retirement salary. And I thought, well, good for you, Chief, but for the citizens whose sons, fathers, uncles are shot and killed in your streets, you're not helping them very much. We need to measure what matters. The things we measure are the things that ought to matter. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the context of 9-11 down the road. So at the risk of exposing the emperor, one of my favorite stories is the emperor's new clothes, who and nobody would laugh when the emperor walked down the street naked because uh, he was exposed to, at the, at the risk of exposing myself and my profession, here's 10 facts in criminology. These aren't the only 10 facts. You know, we have a fixation in my country with a lot of things. Walls, the latest is, we're gonna build a wall between the US and Canada. Good luck with that one, you know? but maybe. Um, it would put people to work, I suppose. <laughs> the best thing, and I'm not sure, well, I think I have a sense of who would benefit more from it. <laughs> so they aren't the only facts, they aren't the, maybe all top ten facts, but they're things we know pretty well. Gender makes a big difference in involvement in crime. Relational distance matters. The closer people are, we, I had a, a homicide cop tell me once, Familiarity breeds attempt. The more you know somebody, the more animus, the more passion, the more emotion in a relationship, the more likely it is to boil over. Uh, demography matters. Risk factors help identify individuals at risk for involvement in crime. Victimization precedes offending. If there's, you know, I taught statistics for too long, 10 years, and I used to say, if you only learn one thing in this class, and lo and behold, one semester I had a kid come up and said, you know, Dr. Decker, I don't think I'm passing. And, you know, we only go to F when we give grades in the alphabet, but if we could have gone to P or Q or R, <laughs> this guy was miles away from being within shouting distance of passing. And he said, but I have that one thing you said to learn. I learned that one thing. Well, if you only come away with one thing today, I think the most important thing is victimization precedes offending. Most offenders were victims before they were offenders. So when we talk about crime prevention, maybe we ought to be thinking about victimization prevention. If we can prevent kids from being victimized, and I'm not only talking about bullying, and frankly, I think bullying is an important but small part of that, we're going to go a long way toward reducing crime. Maturational reform is powerful. We, we talked about this with the members of the uh, gang unit uh, this morning, that a lot of these guys seem to grow out of it. They get tired of the life. How can we take advantage of that? How can we use it to our, to our uh, benefit? Disorder and crime go together. Groups enhance involvement in crime. There's a multiplier effect. The small fraction of offenders account for a large amount of crime, and crime is highly concentrated in space. So gender makes a big difference. Well. Y'all probably knew this before you came to the talk tonight, but males outnumber females in involvement in crime by about 10 to 1 as offenders. Violent crime, the distance, the, the overrepresentation of males is even greater. Couple crimes, shoplifting, where women are, uh, are more likely to participate at higher rates than men. And we also know the, the story about domestic violence. So, okay. You knew that already. Here's the graph from the Bureau of, of Justice Statistics. What do we do? Well, we got to get those young men in prevention programs. We got to do something with the men early. We need intervention programs. We need prevention, but prevention isn't completely successful. For those who fail at prevention, we need intervention programs that can identify young men at the early stages of trouble when they're starting to get in trouble, as opposed to waiting till they come out the end of the serious offender scale and we go, aha, you're going to prison. 
Well, if we could have stopped that earlier, we would have saved the money in, in the intervention, but we would have saved the victimizations. And we're going to see later how important uh, reducing victimizations. Strong relationships uh, in communities also help to build community co cooperation with prosecutors. So relational distance matters. For many crimes, familiarity breeds attempt. This is true in particular in, in domestic assaults and domestic homicides, but well beyond. Rick mentioned that I uh, spent a fair amount of my time <coughs> tracking down burglars, armed robbers, and gang members on the streets of, of St. Louis. I think the most striking finding that came out of the burglary study is how many burglars knew their victims and how many victims of burglary knew the offender and knew who the offender was. That in many cases the burglary was a form of retaliation just as an assault would be, but often by guys who were smaller or guys who didn't want to use a gun or guys who didn't want to shoot. So it'd be a way to get even without exposing themselves to risk. Violent crimes often reflect uh, the intimacy of a relationship and the intensity of an intimate relationship with what we call expressive violence. You know, they didn't just beat them up. They beat them up in a way that their face would be scarred for life. Okay. They, an excessive use of violence beyond that which was necessary to gain the desired outcome, to beat somebody up, to kill them. To kill somebody and then to mutilate the body is a good example of expressive violence. So what do we do? Well, I think it's a starting place is violence against women. Likely suspects, the police know this. We start with the inside of the circle and move further away from the victim. Um, we also know that overlooking family violence is likely to lead to other <coughs> violence. You'll see in a minute that one of the serious risk factors for juveniles becoming involved in crime is witnessing violence in the home. So one of the first things that law enforcement ought to pay attention to when responding to calls at home, are their children present? Have they witnessed the violence? Are they in the process of witnessing violence? How can we remove them and separate them from opportunities to see that violence and the negative consequences that it has. Stranger on stranger, stranger violence is increasingly rare. It hasn't gone away, but the homicide decline in the U.S. is to a great extent a decline of African American homicide rates and stranger and domestic violence homicide. Those three together account for over 80% of the decline in, in our homicide rates. Recalling that we've dropped from, and this is high by your standards, and you should continue to scoff at us for how high our rates of violence are, but our homicide rates have gone from nearly nine per 100,000 to five per 100,000. If we had reduced cancer, illiteracy, uh, you name your social ill by that much, in a 15-year period, you couldn't get that story off the front page of the paper. But that's not a story we see reported very much in the States. Uh, we know that property crime often involves individuals who know each other. That ought to help us put, put cases together. Um, and reporting and testifying is often contingent on relational distance. Victims of robbery who know their perpetrator are much less likely to cooperate with the police in the United States. And when that happens, they put themselves and others at risk for further victimization. Demography matters. Crime varies by region. I, I was surprised to learn when I moved from violent St. Louis to safe Phoenix, there was a time in the, there was a year in the 1980s when more people in Phoenix more pedestrians were killed by cars than people were murdered by guns. This is, this is a city of 1.6 million people. Um, remarkable. I, I came from St. Louis and I thought, boy, I'm leaving a city with a homicide rate of 45 per 100,000, 
for one with a rate of eight or nine per hundred thousand. And I got there and the second day I was in my office, the media called and said, murder's out of control here. And we want to do a story and interview you about why you think it is. And I said, well, I have no idea why because I haven't looked at it very closely. But this out of control issue is a, is a relative issue. You can see the difference in levels of crime and violent end property, part one, serious crime. Higher in the Northeast and the South, Midwest kind of in the middle, and the West, Los Angeles has relatively low rates of violence, and if you take the gang homicides out of the LA homicide rate, they're among the lowest 10 or 15 large city, 10 large city homicide rates in America. So where you live matters. Crime has increased, in suburban and rural areas in the past several decades. We used to, Rick and I were talking about this today, we used to not talk much about crime in rural areas or crime in suburban areas. Many of our urban ills have moved to the suburbs and to the extent that we continue to treat the suburbs as if they're the same safe little havens they might have been in the 1950s, we're gonna miss important problems and rural areas have significant uh, crime problems in, in many cases. It's also the case that large cities have an impact on crime rates in their surrounding county, in their surrounding municipalities and rural areas. Well, what do we do about it? Well, it suggests if we have different levels of crime, maybe we need different kinds of responses. I'm, I'm always amazed to come away from a conference and find uh, police chiefs and prosecutors and uh, probation chiefs who say, oh yeah, that, that worked in Boston and we're going to take it and apply it in our city when the cities are so very different. Boston is a, a very dense, very compact city with a historically low traditions of violence. Uh, what they do there builds on existing community structure. So one size doesn't always fit all, which is where data comes in. How we patrol. So I moved from St. Louis, 61 square miles, 330,000 people, to Phoenix, 1.6 million people, 3,500 square miles. You can't you can't get from one end of Phoenix to the other end in less than three hours at end traffic. It's even worse. Well, it calls for a, an entirely different kind of response, an entirely different kind of data analysis. And then let's talk about risk factors. I think risk factors are uh, one of the important issues to, to pay attention to. Uh, the key risk factors for juvenile involvement in crime include the following. Now I just said one size doesn't fit all and uh, not to apply the findings from one location to another location and I'm going to completely contradict that because these uh, are supported in over 20 large and medium-sized American cities in a dozen countries. Delinquent friends, okay, yeah, well, I, I'm a parent. I, if my kid hung out with the guy I knew who was selling bags of weed at school, I knew I had a problem and they weren't gonna hang out with him anymore. That's not much, of, but delinquent belief systems. And the push question here, the, the, the question that divides if you're in trouble or not is, if you answer yes to the question, it's okay to hurt people to see them squirm. That's the, the push question that identifies. Traumatic life events. You see mom beat up by dad at home. You see dad overdose on heroin. You see the police cuff dad and take dad away from beating up mom. You see dad go to jail. Traumatic life events. The death of a parent at, for a child at an early age. Another traumatic life event that have negative consequences on how kids respond to the, the temptations, the opportunities to engage in delinquency, lack of parental supervision, early childhood aggression. Uh, I did grand rounds with a psychiatrist uh, in St. Louis about 20 years ago with a six-year-old who had harmed a succession of cats and dogs. And uh, when we used to do interviews in the jail, my interviewers had heard it all and they were tough and Rapists, murderers, assaulters, robbers, arsonists, but anybody who'd hurt an animal 
my interviews really got worked up about it. And there's a good reason. DSM-4 and now DSM-5 show that animal abuse at an early age, repeated, is a long-term risk factor. And the psychiatrist who did green rounds after the, the interview with the, this kid who abused a string of cats and dogs, horrible things, um, said to the, one of the residents, what would you do here? Well, I prescribed this kind of treatment and this kind of treatment, and the psychiatrist said, you're completely wrong. There's nothing we can do for this child. We've got to save our precious few resources for the kids we can help. Whew. That, that was a tough one to hear on the one hand. On the other hand, there were 24 beds in the entire St. Louis County area, over a million people. If you thought the kid couldn't be helped, and that's what the science said, then why would you spend your resource on somebody for whom you know the possibility of success is very, very low? Commitment to street-oriented peers. My friends who run on the street are more important than my family. The more risk factors they have, the worse it is. The earlier they start, you know, I, I never told my three daughters this, but I knew that they were likely going to experiment with cigarettes, that they were likely going to experiment with alcohol, that they may experiment with drugs, they may experiment with other risky behaviors, but I wanted them to start later because Experimentation with alcohol at age 20 has very different physiological and psychological consequences than experimentation at 10 or 11 or 12. So limit the number of risk factors, delay onset of risk factors, and try and, and minimize the number of risk factors present in any child. Um, knowing that siblings share risk factors. So if one member of the family has delinquent friends, it's, it's likely that others will as well. When someone says to me, Ricky's 18 and he's in a gang and he's got a 15-year-old brother, said, get, get, the, get Ricky out of the house or get the 15-year-old brother in some sort of counseling or program. So what do we do? Well, the first thing is to effectively identify the risk factors, verify by multiple sources of information on multiple occasions. Work with partners who can identify those risk factors. School see them, social service agencies, city recreation groups often see them. My coaches in high school knew things about me that my teachers and guidance counselors and parents, I hope, never knew about me. So we need to widen the circle of people from whom we get information, and we should avoid making risk factors worse. If a parent can, has to be arrested, and a lot of them do, they can be arrested away from the view of the child and not add to the trauma that the, that kid already faces. Okay, so victimization precedes offending, particularly among juveniles. And it doesn't have to be violent offending. It can be what, what I would call, and what I think most adults would say, you know, relatively benign victimization like the most common form of victimization at school is locker theft. Okay, so, so get rid of their lockers or make them be facetious. But it is locker theft. So how do we reduce that kind of uh, victimization so that the kid who's, whose books are stolen, the kid whose backpack's taken, the kid whose Nike shoes or whatever brand of shoes are stolen doesn't retaliate and act out against, against another kid. Well, um, victimization creates that motive to become an offender. It leads to a cycle of retaliation that heightens involvement in victimization and offending. Um, we also know that repeat victimization is quite an important phenomenon. You know, I, I, did all this work on burglary, and so people would say, you know, should I buy a burglar alarm? And I, I'd say, have you been burglari burglarized yet? And they'd say, no, I'd say, wait till you're burglarized. Because when you're burglarized, that's a burglar telling you there's something good about your house to them. And until they do, and, and the reality is most people who have a burglar alarm don't, don't turn it on, and they don't use it correctly. If you have one, I have one, it's never been turned on. The only time we had it on, it went off and we couldn't get it off and it was six in the morning we were trying to... So, so our answer was, 
like most people, most Americans, we don't turn our bird bird on. First victimization, be careful about the second. So what do we do? Well, we have to make victimization a stronger focus. I don't know, and, and more, more likely here than down south where I live, that there are many police departments that say our goal is to reduce victimizations. Our goal is typically to reduce crime. But we experience victimizations. I come home, my house has been broken. I get out of my car, somebody pushes me and roughs me up. I get out of my car, somebody puts a gun in my chest and, and gets my wallet. Um, how do we prevent victimization? Some of that is environmental crime protection prevention. Some of that is restructuring <coughs> environments so that we don't have you know, corners where people can't be seen, where we have uh, effective lighting. Um, it's also the case that uh, victimization leads to an erosion of trust and confidence in the police. They couldn't even stop those guys from stealing my car. Or the officer who came to re respond to the burglary call didn't act like they were going to, they didn't offer to dust for fingerprints. I'm not sure that the police have been helped, and at least it's off the air now, uh, by CSI and those shows where they swoop in and there's DNA evidence in every crime. And it leads to the conviction of the, you know, people are waiting for CSI to happen. Well, not, not very often. And the reality is if you, if you don't show up in, res in response to a burglary within two or three minutes, you might as well wait to take the report. No citizen wants to hear that. But that's the reality. And the other reality is most burglaries happen during the day when people are gone. They come home at the end of the day at work. The burglary is two, three, four, five, six hours old. The police getting there in two minutes versus two hours makes no difference to solving the crime. Enhancing procedural justice is something we're working hard on in many cities across, across the U.S. And, and I'm happy to say that police are taking the lead there. Um, prosecutors can work in conjunction with other criminal justice partners who can help to reduce victimization risks. Don't make yourself a target. Identifying key times and places where the risk of victimization is high is an important task. So, so I'm here telling you data-driven programs are important. And I was part of a, a juvenile diversion project trying to reduce juvenile victimization. And so the conventional wisdom was, we had no data at the time, uh, kids were most at risk after 8 o'clock at night. My mother used to say, nothing good happens after midnight. And, and of course now I don't know, because of course I'm asleep well before the midnight hour comes around. So we had our uh, prevention program for juveniles running from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, Sunday through Thursday. We didn't have money to go on the weekend, and the weekend was a different issue. And after about two meetings, one of my graduate students said, uh, hey, Doc, I think we're at the wrong time. Most kids are victimized between 4 and 6 o'clock before their parents get home. And not only are their parents not home, but the neighbor's parents aren't home because they're all working, and everybody's got a job. And so they're at risk when they're alone. They're at risk when there's no adult supervision in their house, next door, or in their neighborhood. And so we ran the data on when kids were victimized. It was not at 9 o'clock at night. It was between 4 and 6 o'clock because mom and dad were at home. So our response was after school programs, neighborhood monitors, home visits in the afternoon, trying to respond to when kids were likely to be, likely to be victims. Maturational reform is powerful. You know, um, I, I can't think of what a dopey kid I was at 16, 17, and 18 years old. Um, and the things I thought were important or interesting or worthwhile, but somehow, phew, I grew up. And that's true of most folks. Well, it's true that 90% of American youth will commit a delinquent act 
only 10% of them commit an adult criminal act. So there's a lot of delinquency in, amongst young ages, but then they mature. They grow out of it. They move on. This is a natural social process that we observe re really around the world and in most, in most cultures and most countries. So there's two big times of maturational reform. The first is in late teen during the transition to adulthood. So we get some help there. And the other is in the late 30s. We don't get much for the money we spend incarcerating men and women, but especially men, who get beyond 40. Very few people who get out beyond 40 commit new crimes, come back to prison. They don't want to die in prison. The fear of dying in prison is a pretty powerful motivation. So there's these two bumps of maturational reform that are working for us. They're normal social, social processes. Kids grow up, and then when you get a little older, maybe you can't run as fast. Maybe you're the, you know, how, you, you would know the answer to this, but in, in America this question wouldn't get any answers. How do you survive an attack by a bear? You have somebody who runs slower than you that you hang out with, right? You get to be 40 and stand up all night and party at night after night and being in trouble and being hauled down to the drunk tank and spending the night in the jail looks a whole lot different than it does at 25. First of all, there aren't many other 40-year-olds to hang out with. And there's a lot of 20-somethings and 19-somethings. So what do we do? Well, targeting youth who have begun to engage in reform is something that we ought to avoid. When kids have shown signs of moving on, of maturing, we ought to encourage, not impede those processes. And we ought to think about, I don't know how many of you have smoked and tried to quit smoking, or drank and tried to quit drinking, or used drugs and tried to quit taking drugs. It doesn't go so well the first time. There's a lot of failure. The, the modal outcome for drug courts, and we hold drug courts up in America as a best, and best, pro, best practices program, promising program, most everybody fails the first time. They test dirty. They've used drugs. They fail. And most people fail the first try at reform. But they tried. And so we ought to identify the people who've tried and do something to push them along the reform route rather than push them back into the, into the failure route. Uh, police can work closely with agencies that, ex that assist the transition through reform. So Homeboy Industries is one of my favorite examples here. Charlie Beck, who's the chief in LA, who's been in the paper a lot this week. Homicide in LA is up, and, and Charlie was one of the first chiefs who got out in front and said, I own the homicide rate. If it goes up in LA, hold me accountable. And he said that at the time it was going down, and now it's coming back up. Uh, and he said, I'm accountable at both ends. And we're going to do something about it. We're not going to let it stand. He has coffee every morning at the Homeboy Industries Cafe that employs 350 ex-gang members who've all been to prison. Some of whom are, they have two full-time lasers running to remove tattoos at Homeboy Industries. And they're, the only tattoos they remove are facial tattoos. I mean, you know, you wouldn't want to go into Tim Hortons for your morning muffin and coffee and be served by, you know, the MS-13 tattooed face, right? I mean, a facial tattoo is pretty much a non-starter for, for most jobs. The only tattoos they're working on are facial tattoos. There are so many of them, and they're so consequential. Charlie's in there having coffee every day. He's talking to the guys there. He knows some of them are still in trouble. He knows some of them are still in the life, selling dope, involved in uh, shootouts in the neighborhood. But he also wants them to know that his presence is there not as a deterrent, but because he thinks what Father Greg Boyle is, do, is doing is important and has positive consequences. <coughs> Crossover roles, uh, we, when, when we spoke with the really engaging group of gang officers in the, in the Regina Police Department this morning, we talked a little bit about crossover roles. When officers engage in not just enforcement, but also roles that are supportive, they can also 
they can often play a, a bigger role and a more important part in pushing people back toward conformity and pushing people who have begun to move toward conformity in, uh, in positive ways. And community involvement enhances uh, legitimacy. Um, very important to be active and involved in the community. Can happen in a variety of ways. Disorder and crime go together. Neighborhoods that are disorganized tend to have higher levels of crime. Disorder can include physical things like broken glass, stray dogs. You know, I, when we did all of our work with the gang members, my uh, partner uh, was in a wheelchair. And he, so he drove, he had the hand controls, and he did the driving. So it was time to get out of the car. I was the guy who, who got to get out of the car, and he'd sit and kind of wave at me. And you know, I was never much afraid of the guys, many of whom were armed. Um, lots of them had done bad things, as I was the stray dogs running the neighborhood, because uh, there's no reasoning with a, with a dog. Um, Youth hanging out with no apparent purposes, general sign, broken windows, the broken windows theory as we come to know it. But there are other uh, characteristics of disorder. High rates of unemployment. Neighborhoods with high rates of unemployment, with parents who live, single parents in particular, who live in poverty, uh, uh, are neighborhoods that tend not to be very well organized. And it's the concentrations in the states that the research has shown, it's the concentrations of these things together. So it's not one single mother who lives in poverty in a neighborhood. It's 10 or 12 of them, because none of them can provide help to, to anybody else. If they don't work, how did, how, did, how did I get my summer job? How did anybody get a summer job as a teenager? Well, you'd apply, and those were the ones you didn't do very successfully yet. But if you knew somebody who had a job, or you knew somebody who knew somebody who had a job. Well, that works better in neighborhoods where people are working. But if you're in a neighborhood where most people don't work, who do you go to who knows anything about a job? Because so many people themselves are, are unemployed. Um, well, you know, the police can't fix all the broken windows. Um, the police can't round up all the stray dogs. The police can't get jobs for all the mothers who, who can and would like to work. Um, but they, they see those problems on a daily basis and probably know them better than social workers who work neighborhoods, better than case workers, better than teachers, better than a lot of groups. So the police can play that crossover role. Prosecutors can locate their offices in places with high levels of incivility. So in, in a number of cities, uh, in America, we have this thing called community prosecution. And no, it doesn't mean we're prosecuting the community. What it means is that we're putting prosecutors in offices in high crime areas with an open door and a coffee pot where people feel welcome to come in and talk, where there's a presence of the prosecutor not just in that big scary building downtown, but in the community, trying to solve problems, trying to broker conflicts among people. And prosecutors can go after places with high levels of incivility with both criminal and civil. Landlord training has been among the most successful non-criminal interventions in the states. Groups enhance involvement in crime. 90% of delinquencies committed in groups. Kid who commits a delinquent act all by themselves is a very rare event and probably meriting some other forms of intervention. But most delinquency takes place in a group. Groups are particularly involved in violent crime. Groups enable people to do things they could not otherwise do. And that's a good thing in most instances. When we think about military units, Military units and military training enables people to do things that they wouldn't think they could normally do. I'm committed to the group. I'm committed to the outcome. I don't want to let my, my mates in the, in the unit down. Building that esprit, building that camaraderie, that, that's very useful. That's important. But it also can lead to other, when, when the values are uh, oppositional, it can lead to other outcomes. And of course, gangs and terrorist groups, for example, for example, are 
good, good examples of how groups are engaged in violent crime. And the problem with the group is that if I insult one member of the group, it, it's as if I insulted everybody in the group. And that spreads and is, if you will, it's shared among uh, other members of the group. And as I mentioned, groups enable individuals to engage in behavior they wouldn't normally. Targeting groups can be tricky. Too much police attention could increase group solidarity. So in the, in the early 90s, Kansas City's mayor <coughs> held a gang summit and invited the supposed gang leaders from across the state of Missouri, mostly Kansas City uh, and St. Louis, to a summit and was going to talk to them about the dangers and the ills of the gang life. And the police came and talked, and the mayor talked, and ministers talked. And every guy from St. Louis who went to it, even if they weren't really in a gang before they went, came back to St. Louis and said, I was at the gang summit. The mayor picked me out. The police chief talked to me because I'm the biggest, baddest son of a gun in our city. And so targeting groups can give them status. It can give them recognition. It can sometimes give them uh, resources they wouldn't normally have. Uh, special units that target group crime can, can pay dividends, whether those are in police departments, whether those are in prosecutors. I, I work with a city in the Central Valley in California that has identified its number one crime problem as gang violence, that's identified two-thirds of its homicides as gang-related homicides, and the response to that was they disbanded the gang unit in the police department. And I'm still scratching my head over that one, trying to figure out, and I don't have a good, I don't have any explanation, despite frequent questions about why if you have a gang problem, you would disband your gang unit. Tracking membership in groups accurately, including the onset and the termination. You know, the, the number in the states is we have 750,000 active youth gang members. And we've had that plus or minus 10,000 for the last five or six years. We're also told about 100,000 new gang members join the gang each year. So if we've got 750, that's a stable number, and 100,000 coming in every year, well, 100,000 have got to be going out the back door. Some guys are leaving, or the number would go up by 100,000 every year. This is the kind of math that, that I can do. Um, <laughs> but the number stays the same. So some guys are leaving. Why are they leaving? Well, we ought to get them out of our gang database if they've left. Right? We ought not put that uh, status on them. We ought to not prosecute them if they've made an effort and are successful in getting out. Small fraction of individuals account for a large volume of crime. The famous, famous, famous Philadelphia study, 6% of all youth in Philadelphia accounted for half of all the referrals to the juvenile court. Okay. This is what I like because it's not, you know, it's not brain surgery. Can we identify those 6% of kids? Can we do something with or about or to them or the environment in which they live or the schools they attend or the family members but I especially want to know who the siblings of that six percent of the youth in, in Philadelphia are because those kids are at risk because they got a most likely older brother some small number older sister who's in trouble it's also true that a small number of places account for a disproportionately high number of victimizations. In the District of Columbia, my country's capital, 2% of the addresses account for 90% of all the calls for service. 2% of the addresses account for 90% of all the 911 calls. Well, here again, you know, they're not asking for brain surgery. We gotta do something. What's going on at those addresses? Is there a domestic violence situation that goes on night after night after night? Is there a crack house? Is there a meth house? Is there drugs or guns being What's going on at those addresses? Somebody's got to show up, and the police need to be part of that team, but they can't be the only part of that team. 
because those are complex problems that have been going on a while. In Phoenix, we love, uh, if you've ever been, you know what I'm talking about, we love right angles in Phoenix. And so all of our streets are laid out on a grid except where we have mountains. And they're perfect right angles and almost all one square mile by one square mile grids. We have 20 one square mile by one square mile grids where we have spent $2 million a year for the last 10 years on individuals in the Arizona Department of Corrections. So we have 20, one, and one square mile by one square mile. We're not talking about, you know, 500 square miles. We're not talking about big open spaces. Where we spent two million a year on the Department of Corrections. Now we can't say, okay, we're gonna stop spending that on the Department of Corrections, because some of these characters are in there for a while and they're not coming out. But going forward, shouldn't we think about land use, rezoning, uh, locating programs in those neighborhoods, putting the prosecutor's office in those neighborhoods. So a small number of places account for a disproportionately high number of victimizations. We have to carefully and accurately identify high rate offenders. How do we do that? There are a number of programs that identify, we, in St. Louis, we call it the WOW list. Uh, our major, Harry Hegger, developed the, the phrase WOW and I said, why, Harry, why, why would you call it the wow list? He said, these are our worst of the worst. So these are our wow guys. And um, we used a set of objective criteria. Um, six felony arrests in the last six months. That's, that's a pretty high flyer. Um, prior conviction, gun charges. You got on the wow list. And then those were targeted individuals. And for officer safety, when one of their names was run on the RMS system, the, the police records management system, uh, WOW would come up stamped over, uh, over the information about this individual. So the officer knew they were dealing with somebody who was uh, worth paying much more careful attention to. Um, getting the word out about successful prosecutions. You know, most guys think they're, they're never gonna get caught, and if they ca get caught, they're never gonna be prosecuted. And some, sometimes they're right. Uh, but we can use, you know, we don't market ourselves very well. And we also don't get much of a break from the media, I have to say. Um, but there's this thing out there that would allow us to tell our story every day in the way we want to, and that's social media. Um, and that can get the story about prosecutions out, about crime reductions, about arrests, about takedowns. Um, and Crime is highly concentrated in space. Well, one of the things we sure we're good at now is mapping and hotspots. Um, we can identify hotspots in a variety of ways. What we do with hotspots. Um, is we need to identify them correctly and probably in, a, in useful ways. So hotspots of car theft, so hotspots of arrests, so hotspots of the intersection of risk factors, hotspots where um, Division of Family Services has taken a child away recently. Um, and city agencies and social service and NGOs can go in and work with residents in those areas. So those are the 10 facts. Lurking, though, out there are two additional things I want to throw out nearly in closing about that are, I, I think, big issues that we don't talk about in American policing and probably law enforcement in general. And I call them the 911 problem, and there, it takes two forms. Um, 911 is in Canada and the U.S., computer aided dispatch. You're in trouble, you hear shots fired, something's going on, you've been robbed. There's an emergency, you call 911. Now, a large fraction of those calls are, um, my, my dog's missing, can you help me? Um, a large fraction of those calls are not serious emergencies. But the 911 system has boxed law enforcement in, in a way that I think they're really gonna struggle to get out of. Because we all expect when we punch 911, an officer is gonna eventually sh show up at our door. 
and I think it's a horribly inefficient use of resources. Yeah, I don't think it helps us solve or prevent crime in important ways. But by God, if we punch 911, we expect somebody to show up. The reality is, if your house is burgled, you come home from work and the door's open, and your Aunt Bessie's sewing machine is gone, although a burglar who would take a sewing machine these days, <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, they might as well send a, a trained civilian to take the report, spend more time, take a detailed report, uh, take more computer information, <coughs> conduct interviews, use tape recorders to conduct interviews and treat the data, the interview as data that can be analyzed. Um, and what do we expect our police to do? We expect them to clear calls. Uh, I've been in a couple hundred roll calls and all of them have a sergeant that says, I want you to get out there and clear those calls. So, you know, you and I are on patrol, we're in the squad car, you're driving, I'm reading the, the mobile data terminal. I said, okay, we're going to 1431 Oak. Can you drive there? We get out, there's nobody there. Well, we've cleared that call. And then we go to 5782 North 53rd Street, and we get out there, there's somebody there, and they thought they saw a burglar, and they don't see him anymore, and then we've cleared that call. So our success is measured by clearing calls. And there's no objective evidence that says clearing calls is related to solving crime, to preventing crime. It may marginally be related to building confidence in the police, but we put the police, we, they're, they're stuck, and how they're going to get out of this, I don't know, but it's a terrible way to use resources. And if we were starting over, you know, if you sent police chiefs from the 50, 50 random cities in Canada or U.S. to the board and said, here's a magic marker, tell me how you would build law enforcement in your community from scratch, uh, there would be a CAD system, but it sure wouldn't be implemented or used in the way that it is now. And it gets a lot of demand. There's 180 million 911 calls a year in the U.S. There's 12 million in Canada a year. That's a lot of calls. That's a lot of volume. When the police put a CAD system, more than one police chief has been fired when they put a CAD system up for bid and ended up with the wrong one. It's a, it's a two to five million dollar investment that a police chief is not particularly, there's not much in their background or training really, that enables them to say, this is a good one and that one's not as good and this is what I need. So they hire a consultant and there's a big world of RMS and CAD consultants out there. The, the best ones uh, work out of, that I know, uh, are the ones they use in San Diego that worked out of, uh, out of Vancouver. And the other 911 problem we have, we have this bigger in my country, is that since 9-11 there has been a de-investment in local law enforcement and money that used to go uh, nearly a billion dollars to local law enforcement through the local law enforcement block grant program and the James S. Byrne local law enforcement program has all gone to federal law enforcement. So at, at a time when the recession hit we didn't have money to do policing and we know smart, smartly utilized boots on the street, officers make a difference and can help us respond to crime. We had fewer resources at a time when there was fewer other forms of money. Um, and the FBI, who used to be our partner uh, in local law enforcement, is now busy fighting other guys and not very useful. Um, so what we need is a re-emphasis of the role of local police. Frankly, most local police know who the bad actors are long before federal law enforcement does um, and have relationships with communities to gather that information. Increased cooperation and community engagement. You know, when things go wrong and you don't have a relationship with the community, your ability to walk out and engage an imam, a minister, a pastor is, is pretty minimal. And so building those relationships ahead of time uh, can help survive the storms. So, you know, sustainability and change. How do we survive change? Well, change is ubiquitous. Change goes on all the time. The only constant is change. It's the only thing we can probably come to expect. So how do we survive it? And how do we come out of it better than where we are now? I think data is a large part of the answer to that. 
Um, we need relationships to bridge trouble and negotiate settlements. Uh, data can often help forge a common ground. I'm a big fan of pictures. Um, you know, I've produced a gazillion numbers in my career, but there's two or three pictures that I've made that people looked at and said, oh yeah, I get that. Uh, being able to translate data to graphics is, I think, something that researchers haven't done very well and could, could do better at. Um, Smart Policing is a flexible platform. I think it's got utility uh, in responding to every day as well as special problems. Continue to build support from diverse constituencies. Uh, focus on strategies, styles, and practices. Um, and it's got to be integrated into training and performance measures. If we decided today, if, you know, if you're that brave chief, and in America chiefs serve on average three years. So look, it's like being a sports manager. You're hired to be fired if you're a chief. And that's, that's the reality. And there's a number of them in the room. And nobody's, I'm not running to the front of the line that says, of uh, people, you know, and the line says, the sign says, Come here if you're anxious to be fired. Well, I'm not running to the front of that line. I'm not getting into it at all. But if there's a chief who says, I'm hired to be fired, I probably got three years, um, but I'm gonna make changes in my three years. And I wanna make sure that it's not for naught. I wanna make sure the changes I make can survive my administration. Well, how do I do that? I think the heart, as we had a little conversation at lunch, how do we change the culture of how we respond to crime. How do we change the culture among the people who work for us? Who do we recruit? Do we recruit warriors or guardians? I was so struck when we went to the depot today and we walked through cadets and there were cadets around and in the states if you came through a training academy people would snap to attention and say good afternoon sir and they, and they wouldn't look at you um, and these cadets said, how you doing? Um, there, was a, there was a more engaging approach. Um, guardians versus warriors. So we need to recruit differently. We need to train differently. We need to reward differently. We need to bring a different set of expectations with the knowledge that changing culture may take a generation. I tell my students, look, my generation moved, moved the needle a little bit, but we haven't, we haven't made the kind of change. We're coming up on the 40th anniversary of the Kerner Commission, the report that was issued after the urban riots in the U.S. in the mid to late 60s. And if you read that report today, you'd say, what has changed in America? And the answer is, not enough. So I tell my students, as I would tell the young and young at heart in the room, you all have an opportunity. You all have an opportunity to work in partnership, to demand from your government a different kind of, a better kind of service. And not everybody will get it, and not everybody will change. But if we don't start today, the hole we've dug ourselves in, and I'm speaking mostly about those of us south of the border, is going to keep getting deeper and deeper, and it's going to be harder to get out of that hole, and we're going to pay a substantially greater price than we've paid up to this point. So, I promised I would, this is my email, it's not very complicated, just how I remember it. And, and so if you email me, I'd be happy to respond to questions. Um, we'll find a way to make the PowerPoint available, um, and I guess it would be your turn to ask questions. Thank you. One of the uh, instructors I had for graduate school faced with a couple of statements from students and, and boy there's nothing worse than doctoral students who think they know it all. Um, and he ignored the student, ignored the student, and finally the student said, Professor, Professor, you have to answer my question. And he said, no I don't. And the student said, well, well wait, wait, what? you're wrong. And the instructor said, well you're wrong. 
<laughs> and the student said, well, that's not an answer. Why am I wrong? And he said, you're wrong because you're stupid. And uh, no, we couldn't get away with that today. But if, if that's your response to the talk, uh, you know, I have a hard time with that question. But, but you could be right. I have a big question, if you don't mind. Uh, criminal justice is not my area, but it is very interesting. Thank you. And um, you mentioned the um, issue of delinquent police systems uh, as a contributing factor. Could you elaborate? Uh, what do you mean by the police systems? What the police system in this case involves? Um, a set of values that say it's okay to take things, that the consequences for stealing out of a store aren't things that I consider when I take a candy bar, a, a DVD, a CD, although nobody, nobody buys CDs. Um, when I take your phone uh, off the desk when you're not looking, um, it's okay to take things that belong to other people, it's okay to hurt people, uh, it's okay for me to get my own way if I inconvenience or harm others, that's the way it is. But obviously these are not simply individual social construction, why is it on social system? So we need to look at how these belief systems that come into existence and how they become predominant among a particular group of people who cooperate. And I, you know, somebody who was really good at translational criminology would have drawn a better set of lines. So you've got those delinquent belief systems and then you got groups, right? Because those delinquent belief systems get developed and fostered in groups among people who have been victimized and who are that small 6% who account for 50% of all the delinquent referrals. So I think there's an important interaction among them. The question is, you know, how do, how do they get started and what supports them? And then the more important question is, right, how do we, and since we know most kids mature out, those beliefs change over time. <laughs> yes. Well, the arc of the talk uh, seems to be that crime is located in social experience, not in the soul. And uh, we might want to say, well, we need to socialize social experience with more child protection workers and basic minimum income and more intervention in early education and later education. We could go on and on, but it isn't going to happen because, well, it seems not to happen, and so the police then become a kind of place where these social conditions get addressed with a limited range of instruments. Do you think it's sensible to start thinking of police having a much broader range of instruments? Do you think that would be sensible to have reasonably expensive training in mental health issues and their causes and rational responses in some understanding of the relationship between family, and I know they have it from experience, but the relationship between family violence and offending, I mean victimization, breach of offending, and, and so what police can do in a family situation to speak to the family about maybe their obligation, their responsibility, their, their role in a good life for their children. <coughs> can, we, can we make police better social workers? Well, it's a great, it would be a grand experiment and um, I think it could only be tried in places that have a high enough platform of support for that and it could only be tried in places that were willing to experiment. Um, and that would take a very courageous police chief um, because the first uptick in crime would be their fault. Uh, the reality is now, though, that the police are first responders to most issues of mental health. Um, and we send them there without the training, by and large, and without the resources. Um, Memphis. Uh, Tennessee, in addition to being a very important place in my country's history because Elvis was born there. <laughs> you know, he's born in Tupelo, Mississippi. He lived in Memphis. 
sends police, sends social workers out with police on calls for domestics and for mental illness. Um, you know, imagine a 24-year-old police officer with a couple years of experience, very little mental health training. How many hours of mental health training in the police academy? Twenty-four. A lot more here than south of the border. Um, Twenty-four hours to respond to people with serious mental health issues. You know, the largest provider of mental health services in the United States is the Los Angeles County Jail. The Los Angeles County Jail is not equipped to provide mental health services to all of the all of the inmates who need them. They're not equipped. I mean, it, it, it's it's a mismatch, right? Why, why would you ask a group with minimal training, minimal experience, to respond to what's one of our most complex and difficult social problems, is mentally ill people, people trying to cope with a world that they don't fit in or they don't feel they fit in or they have organic issues that prevent them from, uh, from fitting in. I, I think my argument would be let a thousand experiments go forward because what we're doing now isn't making the problem better. Um, so pairing police and social workers up sounds like a great idea to me, but if we're going to do that, let's do it in a way that's systematic and let's do it in a way that is evaluated so that we know if it makes the problem better or if it makes the problem worse and why, and then we can go forward and be successful. Yes. Um, I know that in relation to the last uh, comment, um, I, I do know that there was a, uh, like I'm not from Regina, I'm from uh, Red Deer, Alberta, province over, and um, I know there that they, they did pair up um, uh, police with a, a psychologist and they would uh, come uh, to cases where there was a mental health issue present and things like that. Um, they had two different teams. One of them got cut from budgetary processes or whatever, but where I worked, we, we felt it was really, really um, good. It's very beneficial. Um, also, uh, we also, I heard that um, a lot of times uh, the RCMP recruiters were uh, asking people for to have a minimum of uh, like a bachelor's or a diploma or bachelor's degree or, or some kind of schooling before they went to uh, training. So that probably helps out a lot of those things. So I guess maybe Canada is trying to move that way with the RCMP at least. Uh, you know, one of the other, I think these crossover roles are really important and where the level of expertise is so high, and, and I think dealing with the mentally ill is one of those, um, maybe the police can't play both roles, so you pair them up with somebody else who can. But I also think there's a lot of other areas we can look um, to recruit help in crime fighting, and we don't think about it very much, but I think the emergency room. Um, you know, we found that of 600 people who came to the, emerge the level one trauma centers in St. Louis a year for gunshot wounds, 350 of them had been there in the prior two years for a gunshot wound or a stabbing wound. So we have recidivists who commit crimes over and over again, but we also have recidivist shooting victims and, not, and stabbing victims. So anybody who comes into the ER who's been shot, stabbed, or beaten up, A, they got a motive to go back and even the score, and B, somebody's identified them as a target, as an appropriate victim. Why, why do we only sew them up, and I don't want to, I spent many nights in the emergency room. Sewing them up could be a difficult chore, but we ought to sew them up, send them back on the street, not just with their wounds healed, but with some prevention tactics with, I mean, I think our best friend in, for people who come through the ER is their mothers, who's, who's sitting out in the waiting room, waiting almost always, you know, it's not the fellow gang members who are lined up grieving for, you know, 
little, little Ray Ray, it is their mothers, and it's their kids, and it's their brothers. I mean, it's family members. So why don't we recruit the family members to help us in our crime prevention efforts who have a, a, a stake in their son, their husband, their uncle, their brother, not ending up there again? Good. One of the nights I was in the emergency room, we had a guy come in with a, a stab wound with a knife in his head, and I didn't know if somebody stabbed, you don't pull the knife out. You wait for the medical people to do that, so I learned something important. This guy came in with a knife in the side of his head, and had gone in and gone between the skull and the scalp, so they took the knife out, they cleaned him up, and they got him sewed up, and they were getting ready to release him, and they were giving him his property, and they, he had to sign, you know, when he when he came in that he had this, that, and the other thing. And he had to sign for his property. They gave him his, his wallet and his keys, his belt and his shoelaces, and his knife. And uh, by law, they were required to give him the knife that he came in with. And he said, I'll, eerily, I'll never forget watching this guy. He took the knife and he looked at it and he said, I could use this. And I thought, <laughs> we've just had a guy who's been a victim of crime, and now we've given him a weapon that allows him to go out and be a perpetrator. I think the ER is a great place for an image. And I say that, I have a, I have a daughter who, tomorrow night, will be in uh, the pediatric emergency room at uh, Cardinal Glennon St. Louis Children's Hospital, um, treating the trauma. The trauma that comes through emergency rooms at night is, is pretty consequential and pretty substantial. And, and if we think that victimization early on has long-term consequences, then maybe we ought to have interventions in the ER that do more than sew them up. Yeah, that knife in the head story is... <laughs> So, but I would say, be worth looking, but I do know, and because I uh, follow them fairly closely, uh, Statistics Canada does a great job uh, with producing much of the same data that our Bureau of Justice Statistics produces. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Just one more. Okay. Um, and, and, and Scott, more, more of a comment than, than, than a question, just based on some of the questions I heard. Um, great presentation, by the way. Really big, really good stuff. Um, it's nice to see it, it firming up because these are things that we've intuitively known for a while. The research is really starting to support it. And, uh, and, and you'll, you'll notice in Canada, we tend to refer to ourselves as police rather than law enforcement. And we see law enforcement as a portion of what we do. Um, and, and just to answer one question about it, it, it employing police uh, or training police as social workers or mental health workers, that might or might not be effective. But one of the things that we've been doing uh, across the country is, is um, uh, building partnerships with, with the professionals that provide those services. So we have seamless, uh, seamless interventions with people in as, as much as we can. And, and our job is to really move more and more of that forward. And we need to be driven by the data on that. And uh, anyway, great presentation. I hate to speak for my other colleagues in <laughs> policing, but um, it really uh, confirms a lot of what we've been uh, trying to build here. Because we know these these social determinants are so important in, uh, in, in keeping crime and disorder uh, in check. So and you. you're often held responsible for things you have no control of. Uh, we got big shoulders. We can have them. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank well, you. So Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. That's all. On behalf of the Faculty of Arts, I'd like to just give you a small token of, of our appreciation for you coming out tonight. Thank you. And uh, we have some refreshments out in the hallway, and Scott will be around, so if you want to bend his ear about some smart policing issue, we'll, we'll all be around here to
to chat. <laughs> Thank you.